Hey all Scott here. This is getting old. I may have finally stopped getting robbed two weeks ago, but I just started getting robbed three weeks ago. Okay, this is getting ridiculous. I'm gonna make some calls and get to the bottom of this. A bank? The bank? A bank. Yeah, I was wondering if I could take out a loan to assign a hit. Uh, let me check. Are you sure your name isn't you? No. Yeah, we repossessed most of your belongings. We are a bank after all. Oh, thank God, I wasn't robbed! Eh. So, can I take out a loan to repossess the repossessed? No, we repossessed your stuff for a reason. We asked if you had any debts and you just wrote SOS. Yeah. Listen, I've seen your services around town. We'll send you a care package to help you get back on your feet, but until then, sir, this is a Domino's. I thought you said this was a bank. Yeah, a night bank. I'll make this work. The classics. Games you may not play all the time, but the idea you can play them on your current system and pull them out whenever and wherever you are, it helps you sleep at night. And honest to God, what's better to fiddle in your pocket with an ice climber? This is a lineup of games released for the Game Boy Advance throughout 2004, titled the Classic NES series. Old school games for the Nintendo Entertainment System re-released on GBA for 20 bucks a pop. You can beat that deal. This is one of Nintendo's first major instances of really pushing nostalgia for that NES era, releasing these games alongside a special edition Game Boy Advance SP modeled after the system. Same thing in Japan, they released a model of the handheld designed after the Japanese NES, the Famicom. Look how tiny this box is, it's adorable! I think the North American variant wins in the handheld aesthetic departments though. I mean, yeah, it does mimic the Famicom, but oh boy, ketchup and mayonnaise. Now, the Famicom released in 1983, the NES released in 1985. All of this happened in 2004, so I think they were trying to break even for the system's 20th anniversary they are probably just rounding up. Yeah, I'm 24, though I always round up, so to be more precise, I'm two. I, for one, am sort of critical of Nintendo's over-reliance on nostalgia sometimes, but I'm their target demographic for this, because no matter what they do, if it's 8-bit, I don't think, I just clap. Like, man, you're really pushing things here. They had the nerve to sell Ice Climber for $20. Yeah, $20 was cheaper than regular Game Boy Advance games, so this isn't a regular Game Boy Advance game, it's Ice Climber. But this NES Game Boy Advance SP is so cool. The outside is like the system, but the inside is like the controller. It's even textured like an actual NES gamepad. Okay, so I really like this design, but it just reminds me of the people who wear NES t-shirts. I'm awkward. The Game Boy Micro also got a special edition themed around the Famicom, this time the controller. This one released in 2005 in both Japan and the US, and I think this design eclipses both SPs. It is gorgeous. Though this was released specifically in commemoration of the 20th anniversary with no real ties to the classic NES series. Well, 12 games were released under the Classic NES series label, with most hitting store shelves on June 2nd, 2004, alongside the Special Edition SP, plus a few more later on October 25th, 2004. Most of them were Nintendo-developed and published titles. We got Super Mario Brothers, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Excite Bike, Ice Climber, Dr. Mario, Metroid, and Zelda 2. Though there were also a few third-party games licensed to Nintendo for release in the series. Pac-Man, Bomberman, Xevious, and Castlevania. Aesthetically speaking, these are really fun to put all next to each other. Other. They all follow a basic black design, reminiscent of the original black box Nintendo releases. However, most of these games didn't originally have the black box design, one with a few sprites and the big title in that iconic font, so Nintendo gave them a black box design. They cropped their box arts and put them on black. It's a little lame. I think it would have been fun to actively design covers as if these games had the black box design from back in the day or something, rather than just putting the cover on a black background. I mean, at this point, you already have the top of the box saying classic NES series, you could have just used the original box art not cropped and everything would have still looked uniform and nice. But no, you just had to put more effort in to make it look like you put less effort in. The boxes do feel like many NES game boxes though, I'll give them that. The back descriptions and screenshots are unique compared to the NES originals, mentioning how the NES classic is back. Finally, play Pac-Man on the go for the 20th time ever. But they still feel very genuinely charming and retro. Even if they don't cost a lot on eBay right now, you still want to treat them with respect. Most of these releases were born to die being a collectible. The next big indicator of a classic NES series title is the cartridge itself. Now most people would probably go, What's the difference? And to that I say, invest in Neon. Classic NES GBA games are a lighter tone of gray, the exact same lighter tone of gray as legitimate NES game cartridges. They put so much damn detail in all of this, this truly feels like they legitimately cared. 
Turns out they did these few things just to barely reach that bar. All right, so let's try these out. First up, we can't go wrong with a little bit of Super Mario Brothers, unless you use it as insulin. Look at that, in all its glory. You know, I can't understate how amazing it was to finally get these games in an uncompromised portable form. Put a D in front of that. So this is Super Mario Brothers on the NES, on the Game Boy Advance. However, fun and quirk of the Game Boy Advance was the screen size. It's not 4x3, it's not widescreen. I consider it husky. NES games were all 4x3, so Nintendo had two options. Either put black bars on the sides like a Samaritan or embrace chaos. So they filled the screen, good for them. I'm sure if they didn't, the group of people who play retro games stretched with smoothing filters on, minimized with borders, well, there's no telling what they'd do. Our nation is separated. They didn't just simply stretch the games to fill the screen, though, they meticulously removed unnecessary pixels to effectively fit the game in this wonky resolution. Thus, whatever the f this is. You have to give them credit. They wanted to see these games fill the screen, and they did it without simply stretching them, though they still look a little wonky. But hey, let's see if I can compare this to similar releases. Here we have Super Mario Bros. Deluxe on Game Boy Color. It's similarly a version of Super Mario Bros. you can play on the go. So here's the advantage you get with the classic NES series. They didn't just zoom into the screen. With Deluxe, sometimes you can't see what's above you, behind you, in front of you, because they just zoomed in to make everything viewable on such a tiny screen. So the GBA version is a bit more playable but you're missing the calendar. Super Mario Bros. Deluxe was a new deluxe version of Mario 1. It included extra modes, a save feature, Mario 2 from Japan was included, tons of little bonus features that I just adore. Like, come on, is this necessary? No, and that's what's fun about it. Classic NES series Super Mario Bros. It's just Super Mario Brothers. there's nothing else to it. And that's what the classic NES series was. They weren't remakes, they were by and large the original NES games, no frills for your Game Boy Advance. I mean, pressing L and R brings us this menu. Ooh. Damn, everybody, let's talk about the weather app. Well, Super Mario Brothers is a classic game. It's one that'll never get old and one that's great to have at a moment's notice. It plays well here, and while it was possible to play the game in some capacity on the Game Boy Advance before, this version is much more tailor-made for the handheld while also being more true to the original. Of course, it had to be a part of the classic NES series. Now, is it worth the $20 MSRP? Well, for like $10 more, you could get any of the Mario Advance series, which were fully fleshed out remakes and ports of the other 2D Mario games, including some new levels, mechanics, modes, the side game of Mario Brothers. It's a tough situation because the entire gimmick of these releases is that, oh, it's the original NES game on a smaller cartridge. Now, honestly, making these collections or something would have taken away from that collectability, I guess. And $20, I mean, that's kind of the bare minimum you can price a physical game without discounts or price cuts. I'd say this one is a bit iffy on if it makes sense for 20. At the time, you could definitely find a copy of Super Mario Bros. Deluxe for less, which had more features. Plus, back in 2004, I think our nation was more used to screen crunch like this. I'd put this in the middle on the worth 20 scale. Uh, next up, Ice Climber. I think Nintendo re-released this for a tax break. Ice Climber is an iconic NES classic. Sure. Most of its appeal comes from the character's inclusion in Smash Brothers, which is 100% why the game was put in this series. Smash Brothers Melee did a number to the interest in various franchises. It's what convinced Nintendo to bring Fire Emblem outside of Japan, so I think they decided to re-release Ice Climber for that very same reason. <laughs> Can't wait for that return on investment. The original Ice Climber isn't a terrible game, it's just a bad one. I think there's a bit of merit to this game. Like the controls are absolutely atrocious, but I think that's partially on purpose to give the game more challenge. But you can select any level from the start, so it's like, who cares about the challenge? There, I beat the game. The two player mode was seemingly removed that remained in Super Mario Brothers, but the multiplayer in that game is just past the Game Boy when you die. But alas, you have to connect another Game Boy Advance to have the option appear. Good. For $20, no, hell, I'll pay you $20 to stay away. It has its charm and a place in Nintendo history. I do sort of like it in some respects. Its core gameplay is fairly enjoyable. It's just the damn controls, man. But as nice as I'm willing to be about this game, let's be fair. This game, as its standalone Game Boy Advance release, f that. <laughs> This should be nothing more than a side game in a bigger game, like Mario Brothers Arcade and the Mario Advance releases. And I think what stings the most here is the fact that Nintendo already re-released Ice Climber as an e-reader card set for the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, so this was a major piece of criticism against the classic NES series. The fact that a good handful of these games, well, they were already on the Game Boy Advance via e-reader cards. Though let's be reasonable here, the e-reader was an accessory for the GBA that nobody heard of until two sentences ago. You'd scan cards to unlock goodies and games or play games right off the cards. Thus, some NES games were re-released via this method for five bucks a pack. Of course, you already had to own the e 
e-reader, which costs $40 in of itself. Keep the e-reader plugged in the entire time and hopelessly scan five cards in a row. The opportunity cost may outweigh things here. It's a little unfair to be like, oh, well, you sold Ice Climber for $5, Nintendo. Why is it 20 now? Because you already had to own an e-reader. Scanning cards was clunky compared to just inserting a cartridge. Just buying the classic NES series game is a simpler option here. Doesn't mean the game is worth 20. Excite Bike. Now this has more value than Ice Climber in my opinion. I think everybody likes Excite Bike. Either that or nobody cares enough to put energy into hating it. Wow, you hate Excite Bike? You fucking badass. While it is the same game as before, you can save your custom built tracks now. It's not that elegant. You don't get a ton of save slots like you do in the 3D Classics remake for 3DS, but it's a noticeable upgrade from how the game operated on NES. This was another game that was already on e-reader card, so that was an issue. You can save your custom tracks in that version, so I finally understand the value of $15. Excite Bike's a better game than Ice Climber, though, and has more replay value. I'd say it's in the middle on the $20 scale. Donkey Kong. Plain ass, old ass, Donkey Kong ass, Donkey Kong. To answer your question, it's not the arcade version, it's the NES version. What did you you think we've been talking about. Donkey Kong's always fun to replay, but I mean, it's just three levels, one screen each. And the NES version, while well, perfectly fine, it cuts out one of the stages from the arcade game, the Pie Factory. So it's like, did, sure, you can use this game to just try to go for the high score, but wouldn't that feel more rewarding if you had the true arcade version in the palm of your hands? You could practice and practice and practice on Game Boy and show up to the arcade, get the high score and in tandem laid. Ah, this is just a way to play Donkey Kong on the go, but at that point, just get Donkey Kong for Game Boy. That original arcade game was remade and there's 90 plus puzzle platformer levels afterwards and that game cost around like four bucks in 2004. Plus Donkey Kong was another e-reader release. Also they could have re-released Donkey Kong Classics which was Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. on one NES cartridge. I know the whole gimmick is it's the original authentic one NES game now on your GBA, but like, come on, $20? I love the original Donkey Kong, but this is pushing it, frankly, I don't think it's worth it. The Legend of Zelda, see, this is one of those games they forced the black box design on. Like, it looks fine and standardized with the rest of the series, but would it have really looked that out of place with the original box art design just with the red header on top? This was the first time Zelda 1 was available portably, and it's an incredibly solid version. They even went in and fixed up some text here in the beginning that was in a dire need of an editor in the original. I think Zelda works great as a handheld game. If this was your first time playing, it can take a while to get through if you don't immediately know where to go, and I think portability helps helps as you can kind of chip away at it. I would have loved to see a remake of this game on Game Boy Advance, a la how Nintendo remade Metroid 1 as Metroid Zero Mission, but for $20, I think this was a standout release. You would definitely get your money's worth out of this game. Until two years later when Nintendo re-released it on Wii's Virtual Console for $5. All right, so those were the Nintendo games on June 2nd. What about the third parties? I am sorry I asked. Bomberman by Hudson. Now, Nintendo still published these Game Boy Advance versions, and I'm sure they developed these ports, but this was always a Hudson Soft property. But Bomberman has always been there for most Nintendo platforms. I'm sure some people think of him as a Nintendo character. Hell, he's been in Nintendo games with Nintendo characters. So this makes sense. On paper, one of the defining elements of Bomberman games is the multiplayer mode, and it's not locked behind a link cable, it's just not here! It's just the single player mode from the NES game, it's fine, but you do realize how many ways there were to play Bomberman on Game Boy Advance, right? I mean, most Bomberman games are kind of interchangeable, a Bomberman game is a Bomberman game. Some are better than others, but at the end of the day, most will give you your Bomberman fix. So it's like... All of these exist, you know? And Bomberman's known for multiplayer. You take it out of the equation and the main game is okay, but it's so strange to me that they went to all this trouble to preserve elements of these other titles, but strip Bomberman of its headlining feature. No! Pac-Man, it's the NES version, of course, and I've been critical of this one before. Listen, it's not a bad addition of the game at all. I just don't like when products claim to have Pac-Man included and it's the damn NES version of the game. You're telling me me I got horny for nothing? Like the graphics and sound are just different enough to make this feel kinda lame. This is one of the strangest inclusions to the series. Pac-Man was already well represented on the Game Boy Advance. You had an Namco Museum with the original arcade version alongside a handful of other Namco classics and Pac-Man Collection which had Pac-Man and various other games from the series. Both of these games came out well before the classic NES series release of Pac-Man so it's fair to say you could find them for $20 or less at this point. So this just feels like a waste. Why would you buy this outside of collector's purposes? There's no reason for this to exist. I think Nintendo did this one because it's Pac-Man. 
It's not like it's an iconic NES game, but I think it kind of helped bring more eyes to the lineup. Like everybody knows Pac-Man and it kind of reminds them of the NES era, so sure, I didn't need lunch today. It's like on the front of the NES Classic Edition mini console box. Like why is Pac-Man highlighted here? There are so many other games iconic to the NES that they could have chosen to represent. Instead, did you say Pac-Man? And finally, we had Xevious on this day, another Namco arcade classic getting its NES version re-released. They added auto-fire to this version, which is kind of nice, but other than that, it's Xevious. Oh my god, finally. At least this game wasn't available elsewhere on Game Boy Advance, so good for me, I get it all to myself. But I'm an American, all right? If there's two things I don't care about, it's my morals and Xevious. This game was far more popular in Japan, and while I think it's still fairly well known over here, there are so many other NES games. Hell, Namco or Nintendo developed and published games that would have made so much more sense for a classic NES series re-release. A fine game, it's a little too high score centric for me to consider it worth the $20, though I think it's at the very least half worth it. And that was the first wave of the classic NES series. Cool collectibles that just didn't have a ton of value outside of that. The games they picked were so basic, it made it difficult to warrant picking some of these up, which I think they tried to rectify this complaint with the second and final wave. On October 25th, 2004, we got four more titles. First up, Dr. Mario. Oh, guys, come on. Did you really have to put black bars around the artwork? Who cares? Most of the image is the artwork anyways. Just go all the way. Especially the third party games I just went over. These just look bad. Pac-Man probably looks the best. Bomberman, they cropped out most of the artwork and the original box would have just been so easy to translate over. And Xevious, well, they just didn't care. Dr. Mario is a safe bet being a puzzle game. You'll for sure get your time out of this one. If you wanted to play a Dr. Mario game on the handheld, this was giving you exactly what you were looking for. You could have gotten the original Game Boy version. Now that one technically sold better than the NES one. So more people may have had memories of this one, strangely enough. But for a game all about matching light colors, stay away. Though there were more ways to play Dr. Mario on GBA. In WarioWare Mega Micro Games, you could unlock the Dr. Wario game, which was fundamentally NES Dr. Mario, just with a few sprites changed. And a year after this classic NES series release, you could pick up Dr. Mario and Puzzle League, which included a much better version of Dr. Mario and another puzzle game entirely. The best puzzle game entirely. You know what, I'll say this was worth the 20 bones. At least at the time. I mean, this was perfect for the pick up and play style. There wasn't a Dr. Mario on the system natively at the time. The closest thing was an unlockable minigame in WarioWare, and that wasn't like a full port of NES Dr. Mario. It was a joke inclusion that could also effectively double as a Dr. Mario alternative in a pinch. And Dr. Mario and Puzzle League came out afterwards, so you can't really blame them for that. I will give this my full praises it might have been worth $20. Metroid, all right, this kind of works with the black box design considering Metroid was one of the games that followed the template but used silver for some reason. If anything, this box actually might look better than the original. Metroid can be hard to go back to, especially without a map system. It's hard to know where to go and even where you are, which is why I would recommend the remake on Game Boy Advance, Metroid Zero Mission. It does a phenomenal job contextualizing that original NES game as a modern title. It has quality of life improvements without feeling too easy or like it's holding your hand while also featuring tons of added content. It's the definitive way to experience the first game in the series. And it came out in February of 2004 and included the original NES Metroid in its entirety as an unlockable for beating the game. I guess this is for the people who wanted to play the original Metroid on GBA but didn't want to put in the work to beat Metroid Zero Mission to unlock it. Honey, if you want to play Metroid 1 but not Metroid Zero Mission, that's your own damn fault. This is just weird. I mean, the version of Metroid included in Zero Mission is basically the exact same. There are a few discrepancies, like some sprites look a little different in the Zero Mission version, but they're both NES Metroid. There's no true differences. It's hard to imagine Metroid not being a part of this series. I get that. But when you already released Metroid Zero Mission earlier that year, it just feels unnecessary. If it were the other way around and this came out before Zero Mission, then sure. But no, instead, they're forcing me to bitch about it 17 years later. Those bastards. Zelda 2 The Adventure Link. Following in the steps of the Zelda 1 box design-wise, this is another solid investment. Zelda 2 may not have been the most beloved Zelda title, but it's still a good game. It's just different, and the amount of playtime you get out of it, well, I think it makes it well worth the $20 price tag. And finally, Castlevania, the last classic NES series title and another third-party one by Konami. Come on, guys. It's just a really stupid cropping of the silver box art. Like, really? I think this is also well worth the investment. Castlevania was already in a renaissance on the Game Boy Advance with three original titles on it. Those followed in the footsteps of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, so there was still a void of classic Castlevania. 
and I think this was a great addition to the lineup. Well, that's the classic NES series. For collectors, this is a pretty fun series. It's cool to have these miniature NES boxes and great cartridges and try to go for them all. But for players, I just feel like there's not enough there to warrant a purchase. These games were just kind of neat little novelties, but that was about it. The only games I think that you could actually warrant a purchase on were Zelda 1, 2, and Castlevania. But they were kind of cool releases just for the novelty alone. And just like that, Japan told us to go f ourselves. These are the Japanese versions of the classic NES series, titled the Famicom miniseries. They went above and beyond in Japan. First off, the packaging its entirely unique, unlike traditional GBA game boxes. A clear plastic container with numerous cardboard inserts holding an exact replica of the original box art, now the size of a matchbox. The instructions are all folded up nice and neat. These just feel like so much love and attention was put into them. Even games that originally had different box dimensions on the Famicom, they accommodated for them, and games that released via the Famicom disc system, well, they have their own style of box as well. And because the disc system games were yellow, the carts are too! The standard games have a color scheme reminiscent of the Famicom console, not the cartridges because they were all different kinds of colors. It would have been really cool if they used the same colors each cartridge was originally, but this is still neat. The games themselves, it's the same story as before, except these are the Japanese versions. But Japan got dozens more games on top of every single one that released in North America. Mario Brothers, Balloon Fight, Clue Clue Land, Wrecking Crew, Famicom Detective Club 1 and 2, Kid Icarus, The Mysterious Murasame Castle, Shin Onigashima, Super Mario Brothers 2, Mappy, Star Soldier, SD Gundam World, Dig Dug, Gon Bear Goemon, Ghost and Goblins, Adventure Island, and Twin Bee were all Japan exclusives. And my god, why did we get Ice Climber out of all of these? There were so many games that I think would have made perfect sense in North America. I mean, come on, Dig Dug and you gave a Xevious? I know Dig Dug was already on Namco Museum, but still, like, why did we get Xevious? I think this lineup of games does a far better job representing the NES, or Famicom, technically. I think Contra, Mega Man, Bubble Bobble, Punch Out, River City Ransom, Double Dragon, Tecmo Bowl, Kung Fu, those seem like they would have been easy to get as a part of the series and would have really helped to lock this in as the perfect celebration of the console that started it all. But these will do. I have similar complaints towards why some of these got the re-release. Like, Mario Brothers? Really? That was included in damn near every Mario game on the Game Boy Advance, and it was a much better version than the NES game. Each day Nintendo re-releases Clue Clue Land, I hear gunshots. However, the Famicom Detective Club games? Well, those are huge titles. I can't play them at all, but these were great inclusions for Japanese-speaking players. Balloon Fight? I would have preferred compared to Ice Climber over here. There's just far more variety, basically, because there was more released. And they made sure you knew that by releasing these boxes. Japan's Club Nintendo loyalty program offered these collection boxes containing every game from the Famicom miniseries at the time. They came in unique mailers and sliding them out, we have some of the coolest collectibles I've ever laid eyes on. Three volumes, the first two being the cartridge-based games, the third disc system. Each one has this amazing slipcover featuring sprite art from the games included. Opening them up, we get each of the games nestled and displayed with a plaque. This is the kind of treatment I love to see video games get. This almost looks like something you'd see in the Football Hall of Fame, but way cooler. Like, oh, that's the football Malcolm Butler intercepted in the Super Bowl? Like, who gives a shit, dude? That's f***ing Dig Dug! Now, this collection doesn't include two specific titles, Mobile Suit Z Gundam Hot Scramble and Second Super Robot Wars. The former being a limited 2,000 copy print run giveaway to owners of a Gundam game on GameCube, the latter being just a straight up purchase bonus for another GameCube game, and buy that game, get this one. These ones were released later on after the initial Famicom miniseries wrapped up, but I'm happy with just these. They've been some of my most wanted collectibles for a while now. I've always loved the look of them, and on top of that, they're functional. I have practically the entire Famicom mini collection by owning these. I can get used to this whole owning thing again. Well, that worked. I'm gonna need more stuff to talk about for the coming weeks, though. Yeah. It's no.